It's been a really interesting, for me at least, month or so of releases. Well, not, not even month. I think the HX1 came out a, a long while back, and this was kind of, to me, the first indication that something was changing in the modeling world. And so I think I wanted to do a video on that and talk about how I think things are sort of pivoting away, or at least we're in this current state of change where what modeling companies seem to be doing is trying to extend their customer base beyond just selling their flagship modelers and actually trying to scoop up some of the audience of guitar players that are out there that are using kind of more traditional pedal setups. This seems to be a thing that is maybe confusing some of their normal customer base and also alienating some of this. So I kind of just wanted to do a little bit of a video on that and talk about how us as kind of like the hardcore modeling fans can sort of navigate our way around these things. This channel is supported by Truefire. Truefire is an online library of lessons from some of my favorite players. There's thousands of lessons on there. You can use the promo code JNC40 to get 40% off of any of their courses. context here maybe is important so in old times basically uh, modeling stuff used to be somewhat cheaper there was definitely this period where sort of like line six were at the pinnacle of it for the start and then prices sort of started to come down and it became kind of um, more entry level gear and that was kind of what line six was about fractal came along and also digitech kind of went away and, and Fractal basically decided that the model was going to be from this point on that the unit itself could be more expensive and for the life of the unit they would continue to support that and develop it and what we've really seen since then is like a, a kind of blossoming of the modeling world where it's become a really pretty interesting scenario where people buy a piece of hardware once and whether it's like the Fractal FM3 which is quite a lot cheaper than the Axe 3 and FM9. It would get the same updates regardless. Uh, and likewise, the HX Stomp, which is like three times less than the full Helix, um, that would get access to the same updates, the same regularity of update schedule, the same amount of models and all this sort of stuff. That's been the way things work, right? And I think what really has been happening is that these companies have focused on a flagship product, like for Line 6, it'd be the Helix. For Fractal, it would be the Axfex and then the FM9 and the FM3, to be fair. Quite expensive units that do everything. And that's kind of been the thing that a lot of us modeling people have been used to this kind of all in one approach. However, I think what that does do is leave a bunch of the more broad guitar audience not using any of these devices because they're like, well, I'm not going to spend, you know, two grand on a FM9 when I'm only really looking to use a few delays and a few reverbs or I'm not going to spend all that money on an HX Stomp or Helix when I'm not sure that it actually integrates that well with my amp. Uh, you know, I know that Strymon stuff works, for example, you might think, or all of this sort of stuff or the kind of other thoughts that go with this, whereas where if you're buying a unit that kind of does everything, you kind of just assume, I think, in general that it must do things slightly worse than if you were to buy a Maris or a Strymon piece of gear. There's kind of that feeling, right? Where it's like, because Line 6 do modulation, because they do delay reverb, they do all of the effects that we kind of necessarily assume that actually the quality of that stuff might not be 
as high as Strymon. What's been interesting is to see like Lion 6 came out with the HX1 which is capable of loading just one algorithm at a time and you think well that's a real departure from the HX Stomp which could load 8 uh, or real departure from the Helix which should load 64. You know these things that are actually definitely not the sort of thing that I guess us as hardcore modeling fans are expecting or even things like the Pod Express which is Definitely a more kind of entry level unit, a couple of hundred quid, you get access to like a paired back experience, you know, so they kind of curate out some of the amp models, some of the effects as a way of sort of selling off a bit of the kind of stuff that is in the Helix or the HX Stomper and the Podgo, but being able to charge far less for presumably a way less powerful unit that is slightly cheaper to make, but also is going to maybe hit a completely different target market. The Nano Cortex kind of takes one modular aspect of the quad cortex and says, right, we can do capture on this thing. They've said that there's going to be like a future of updates for the nano cortex and it is going to be its own kind of platform, which is interesting to hear. But again, this was one area that seemed to kind of confuse and somewhat fall flat with a bunch of the core audience of quad cortex users who some of them were even looking for a more powerful unit apparently actually for me personally i've kind of come to the point where i've realized that actually the flagship modelers are great but oftentimes they're not totally being used in the way that i guess they're designed to be used a lot of the time for a gig i'm using a relatively simple preset maybe just has an amp a drive a couple of drives a reverb a couple of delays and maybe a sprinkling, a chorus, or some other modulation. And actually, something a little bit more pared back can kind of suit a wider audience in some ways, as well as being able to sell the thing for considerably less. Like, say, this is like 485 quid versus the full quad cortex, which is like 1450. Especially when you think that there are going to be people out there just using a quad cortex for like one capture at a time with a few effects then it makes total sense that you'd bring out something like this, which caters to the audience that are not using the full breadth of what a quad cortex can do. And this is, again, something for me where it's like one of the first things that I do with some modelers is kind of see how much you can do with them, like how many blocks can you fit in. But in the reality, most of the time on a gig, I'm not going to be doing dual, triple, quad amping. I'm not going to be using seven delays in a row. I'm not going to be using these kind of elaborate freeze effects that I put together. I'm actually generally going to be using something quite a bit simpler. I don't know if you guys can relate to that at all. And that's kind of the thing with the Fractal VP4 where uh, I'm seeing people, you know, say, you know, it's totally valid to have thoughts on pieces of gear. What I think Fractal are doing here is just putting out a product which is going to answer a question for other parts of the market and whether that ends up succeeding or not. You know, there's an audience of folks out there that might be using, for instance, still the Strymon Trifecta. You're using your Mobius, your Timeline and your Big Sky. This kind of thing could replace that for you, right? You see Andy Wood has been using it live. I'd be interested to see how he's actually using it. I wonder if he's put up a video yet. You know, you've got people out there that are going to be experimenting with the Eventide H90, which I've had one of those I actually think this is more flexible, has about 10 times the effects, way more easy to use. The PC editor works really well with this. So there are other bits of gear out here that are answering the same sort of question as the Fractal VP4. It's just that I think when we're used to like all-in-one modeling solutions and the flagships, that this sort of thing then becomes a bit more expensive versus what we're used to paying. So you think like a Fractal FM3 is maybe like twice the price or slightly under twice the price of VP4 for maybe four times the amount you can run about 15 blocks, something like that, 12 blocks with an amp and a cab. Then, you know, there are other things out there which look quite a lot better value for money in a lot of ways, right? But I think it's because we're comparing them to some of the things which are actually not answering the same question that this does. So that's kind of my thought, like, is this where the future of some of this is going? Because it's probably quite costly to generate a flagship. And also I think actually the pace of updates doesn't really necessitate uh, a change of the flagship hardware as often as maybe it would need to, to generate that kind of income for a company. What you could do instead is this sort of thing where you're sort of 
breaking apart the kind of ecosystem into a modular approach and trying to reach out into the wider pedal market, I think that's what's happening. And I think it's not necessarily a bad move, but I think in some cases when your core audience is like looking for the latest, greatest flagship thing, then I think there is like a little bit of a expectation that's not quite being met by these things. So I'd, I'd let me know your thoughts in the comments. And actually maybe these sorts of things are, are way more suited to folks that are using something like the Universal Audio UAFX pedals and that sort of thing, or people that are using a, a tube amp with a, an FX loop, or people that have got a pedal board where they actually want like one key multi effect, or people that, you know, want a capture device, but don't want to spend 1500 pounds and aren't really interested in all the other stuff that the quad cortex can do. Let me know your thoughts in the comments if you've got any.